love, grace, and mercy, and for the hope we have in you. And we ask you to touch us tonight through this time we spend together in your word. Let your anointing touch us and bless us and empower us by it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, tonight we continue on our study of the book of Acts, and we are going to begin tonight in verse 36 and um, go through verse 38. We're not going to get too deep and too far into this tonight because, or too much farther in this tonight because of talking about repentance and talking about those things. And I know we've been talking about this and been dealing with this on our uh, Wednesday night study, and we'll continue that because each one of the seven churches, except for um, Smyrna, has a element of repent or else, or repent or stop, or you know, quit doing what you're doing. So uh, repentance is something we have been talking about, and all of you are regular partakers of that, that uh, particular Bible study and the things we do there on Wednesday night, so I realize that and understand that. But anyway, we're going to talk a little more about it tonight and look into it in, um, in some kind of depth and detail as we, as we uh, go through our study tonight. So, Acts chapter number uh, 2, verse 36, and the word tells us that, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The ministry here that we see that begins immediately on the day of Pentecost is powerful. And the very first thing that, that Peter brings up to them here is, is that Jesus, this Jesus whom you crucified and whom you killed, and I reread verse 36 for that purpose, and immediately the, the response from the crowd is, what, what do we do? What must we do? And Peter's response is the same response that we have today, the same response that when we, when we preach the gospel on Sunday morning especially, and even during, our, uh, during the time of, of where it was, um, you know, people we weren't, didn't know who we were watching and what have you like it is right now uh, over the internet, even then, we don't know for sure who's watching and who's saved and who's not. It's sitting here on Sunday night. I don't generally give an altar call, um, you know, and, and, and I assume that y'all are all responsible and mature enough Christians that if you need to repent and need to do something about sin in your life that you're going to take care of and you don't need me to give you an altar call on a Sunday night or Wednesday night, but, on, but on, when we're on, uh, on live like we are now, there's those moments that we certainly stress that, talk about that. But um, any time the gospel is preached, there should be, uh, based on the situation, there should be an opportunity for people to repent, people to, to respond. And that's what it was. This is the response to the gospel being preached. And their response wasn't even an issue where Peter said, Peter didn't even have, this is the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost because Peter didn't say to everybody that wants to come to Jesus, raise a hand, God bless you, I see those 3,000 hands. It wasn't that. It was, all right, we've heard you, now what? Now what do we do with this? What, where do we go from here? And Peter immediately says, repent. And throughout the word and throughout what we find um, through the book of Acts, we're going to look at some of that also. Of course, we'll look at what John said, John the Baptist said, as well as Jesus here in our study tonight is repentance, is repentance. And that repentance we know from what we talked about on our Wednesday night Bible study and other, other occasions we've talked about it. And really, I think, you know, you hear me talk about repentance and I've always talked about how it's turning our back and going the other direction and, you know, going toward God. But even what we've, what we've learned and talked about over the course of our Wednesday night Bible study, it has taken it even farther. It's not just, you know, turning and going, but it's figuring out Okay, I'm on the wrong track. I'm on the wrong. I'm on, I'm on the journey, and I'm going the wrong way, doing the wrong things, and I've got to stop and turn and go the right way, go the right direction, and work toward my journey. And for an awful lot of people, it's kind of like what Rick Renner brought out, and what I've shared on our Wednesday night Bible study is: for for a lot of people, they have remorse. They're sorry for their sin. They wish they weren't doing that, but to actually repent to the level of total total change, <clears throat> a total adjustment, <clears throat> excuse me, adjustment to behavior, attitudes, actions, all those kind of things. That doesn't always happen. I can tell you when I was young, 
uh, when I was a young man. There were there were things in my life that had no business there as a young Christian, and I kept on having to go back. And it was, you know, it was going back to the altar time and time and time and time and time again over some of those things. And and um, and I've known a lot of people. I've pastored a lot of people over the years that, you know, there there was a time that if if this particular young man was in service and I gave an altar call or I gave a call for repentance or rededication, recommitment, or whatever, his hand's going up. It's just, it's going to happen. You can count on it because he struggled and he struggled hard. And the difference in that is, and it's probably my fault as a pastor that I didn't get to the place here where I am now, is let's not just be sorry about it. Let's not, let's not wish we weren't having that issue. Let's turn, let's, re, let's, let's change course, change direction and go the right direction. And that's, that's the real point that I, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure, I'll be honest, that before, I've always understood repentance, and I've taught and preached about repentance, and it's, it's taken a, a more, um, I don't know, more serious turn, or definitely a, a little bit different, different mindset on repentance that I've been teaching as of late over the last several months, but, but repentance, I think for a lot of preachers, just listen to, to messages that I hear other preachers preach, and listening, you know, the, the few TV preachers that I've ever listened to very much or other pastors that I might listen to their, their messages on occasion. When it comes to that repentance, it is, okay, God, I'm sorry for my sin and I'm you know going to do better. It's, I'm not sure I've heard anybody up until Rick Renner, honestly, go into detail and talk a lot about, this is not just saying I'm sorry, wishing I hadn't done it, remorse. This is a total change of mind, change of attitude, change in body, change across the board in every way possible if that's if that is the situation as the holy spirit convicts us guides us leads us and so on we should be responsive to that and that takes us to that place of total repentance so we're still not perfect we're still not above temptation you know coming at us and we're still not above slipping or just outright doing something but we should be better we should be to the place as we mature in christ that repentance is not a regular thing for the same old thing over and over again. That's I think that's the point I'm trying to get to and trying to trying to help, you know, in the teaching that we're doing on this is to get us to understand that if we're going back to the cross over and over the altar or however you want to think of it, over and over and over and over and over for the same old thing, like it is in some people's case, <clears throat> somewhere down the line we haven't got the message across. We haven't heard the message and understood the message to the point of change. And that's, I mean, the old man passes away, everything becomes new. That is repentance. That is turning your back on the old sinful lifestyle and going forward. So what we see in the Gospels, among other places, is some good solid stuff here. John the Baptist uh, gives us some example here. I mean, Luke chapter 3, verse number 3, he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And it is written in the book, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So John, John the Baptist, before Jesus uh, comes on the scene, before Jesus begins to minister, John the Baptist is preaching a baptism of repentance. He's preaching a message of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And who's he preaching to? The Jews, of course. And the Jews, we know, based on based on what we see, is you have you have corruption from the head down. You have a mess, and, and when Jesus addresses it, broods of vipers, whitewashed tombs, you're not saying that about good folks. You're saying those things because they are terrible. And they are leading people. And that, here's the issue. It's not just that we are that we're dealing with you know, these guys are corrupt and they're a problem. They are leading these people corruptly. They're leading these people into the corruption and they're not just they're not just messed up and into what they're doing and how they're acting. They're leading people to be messed up and acting the same way they're acting. And you know, what the uh, the, the phrase has come to mind that when you when you make a proselyte, you, you make a proselyte Jew, the, he's, Jesus himself said, You make them twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Now that's rough, that's harsh. So it, it's it you know so again we, we can go back to the book of, of Revelation and where we see where he's talking telling them about you know you're doing this wrong and this has got to change repent and, you know and I'm dealing with this uh, to get you to repent it's the very same mindset of 
you people are, you're, you're doing good. And listen, the Jews were not a total wash. There were good things they were doing. They weren't completely and totally just, you know, just, just throw them all in the trash and get rid of them. There were good people. And we know that because the encounters that we see with, with um, um, Joseph of Arimathea, who, who spot them, they have Nicodemus. I mean, Nicodemus, he snuck around to do it, and Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea apparently did at some point. But these men came to Jesus, listened to Jesus, and let Jesus have an influence on them. And, you know, and th those we know of for certain in Scripture. And Jairus came to Jesus. I mean, of course, I still think that was a scandalous thing, and I think he probably suffered for that. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I would hope that I am. But, but John the Baptist, when he's ministering, he is talking to the Jews who for centuries, at least 400 years, are being influenced by people who have not heard a revelation or a prophetic word from heaven for 400 years. Remember that now. Because the last word we have is Micah. And for 400 years, we preach this at Christmas every year, you know, 400 years of silence. There's 400 years of silence. We talk about how there's no revelation from God or there's no revelation the people perish. And we talk about those things usually around that time of year. And all of that is true. All of that is fact. But you've got a man that, that steps up who is not part of the, the priestly class. Yes, his father was. But John the Baptist has gone out into the wilderness. He's eating locusts and wild honey. And he's dressed in camel's hair. And he is not part of the system. That's his first strike. First number, strike number one is that. So then he has the audacity. And of course the, the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those other seeds come out to hear him. And some of them he reaches. Some of them he gets to. But a lot of them are just coming out to hear what he's saying so they can use it against him. And I promise you. Among the Jews, that uh, of, the, of the religious Jews, the hierarchy, the hierarchy of the Sanhedrin, Pharisees, Sadducees, and so on, those people, when John the Baptist was killed, they were not crying tears for John the Baptist. Because here's what John the Baptist, we don't know exactly what John the Baptist is preaching, but we know he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent of what? Repent of your religious nonsense that's not doing a thing for anybody. You know, you, and, and I can assure you that some of what Jesus said about how you're putting heavy burdens on people and you're not lifting a finger to help them, I promise you that that would be some of what John the Baptist is talking about because what do we know that when God speaks, whoever he speaks through, there is that common thread that goes through it all. And it goes back again to repentance. It goes back again to let's make a decision. Let's do the right thing because it's the right thing. And this the repentance. Repent of what? Repent of not given God the promise and place he deserves in your life. Repent of your sin. And if you are sinning, it's because you have been either taught or allowed or some other way that sin is, has entered into that situation. So John the Baptist, he's preaching, he's teaching, people are repenting, he's baptizing people all over the place. We don't know how many. We know he had followers. We know he had disciples. Um, of course, we know that his followers became Jesus' followers naturally, and that would be, that's a natural progression there, and it's a good thing that it would be. If any of John's followers didn't become followers and disciples of Jesus, they missed the point, right? Because, I mean, that is the whole point of what John was doing. That's why John existed, um, was to get people to understand who Jesus was and to follow him. So John preaches his, his gospel and his message of repentance, and lots of people do, and lots of people come, come to John and are baptized by John. Uh, for the forgiveness of their sins, and John fulfills the role that God called him to fulfill. Now, uh, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter number 1, and uh, verse number 14. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel, the good news. The good news is that, that, that Messiah has come. That is the good news. Uh, for the Jew, of course, we know that, that uh, as we'll see as we go through the book of Acts, also for the Gentile. But the, the message of, of repentance that, that John preached, Jesus carried on. Of course, it's his message to, when it comes down to it. But the, the question here of, of repentance, again, Jesus himself addresses and says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is here, I'm here. I've come to tell you, to teach you, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe that the Messiah that you've been waiting for for generations has finally come, 
and he proved himself time and time again. He proved himself as a healer, as a teacher, as a prophet, as everything that, that the Messiah was going to fulfill, Jesus fulfilled it. And still yet, the people who should have recognized him first and foremost completely and totally rejected him, completely and totally um, shut him out. He wasn't born the right way. He wasn't with the right family. He wasn't this. Everything they could think of that was wrong. And some of those people, you know, you, you, we all know some of those people, that it doesn't matter what the subject is. You can talk politics. You can talk religion. You can talk um, movies. You can talk music. I don't care. You name the subject practically, and you're going to find somebody that doesn't matter what you say, what you think, they're going to have a problem with it. Some of us are related to people like that. Some of you don't. Some of you don't have that privilege. But, but uh, nevertheless, you know. But you start talking to them, and right away, it goes to well, you really don't know nothing. You're just ignorant. And here's what the real truth is. And everything Jesus said, and it reminds me a lot of, of, of some contemporary things as well. But everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, there was always blowback. There was always somebody. Some of the Sanhedrin, some of those, some of the Sadducees, Pharisees, that are right there on the spot. They're like, "Well, you know, he must, he's, he's obviously got a demon. He's obviously wrong. He's this. He's that. He's doing it on the Sabbath. He's doing nothing that Jesus did. Nothing Jesus did was satisfactory to at least somebody on almost every occasion. Now we don't know what happened with Jairus. I'm sure Jairus was in more trouble than anybody. Um, chances are Jairus lost his position. I." I think he may have been one of the 120 in the upper room. We won't know that until we get to heaven. But uh, So let's make sure we get to heaven so we can find that out. That way that, that gives us something to go for if we don't already have something. You know. But, uh, but you know, Jairus, Jairus took such a chance, and he did it for all the right reasons because he had a need in his life and a need in his daughter's life, and Jesus met that need and answered that call. I mean, it's such an incredible moment. And I love that story. I love the whole, the whole mindset, and I wish we knew more. Like I do on so many things, you hear me say that all the time. I wish we knew more about the, the, the ins and the outs in the house, how it all played out, and what happened to Jairus, and what happened to his family. You know, it there it just had to. Come, it probably turned out pretty rough for him. I, and maybe not, maybe not, maybe, maybe. But I mean, you had a man born blind that Jesus healed, and they they called the, to use the phrase we use today. They called him on the carpet. They first called his parents, and his parents they wormed their way out of it. He's of age. Don't you ask him. Smart people, that's there, I promise you. Smart people you find in the Bible. You know, he's of age, ask him. He can, he can speak for himself. And the dude's like, all I know is I can see. And, you know, and it's, it's such a cool thing. But how in the world, if you are a, well, you're a minister of, of God, you are a prophet, a priest, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever role that those, those folks thought they fulfilled, how can you possibly be mad because somebody is healed, somebody is delivered, somebody, you know, whatever, whatever situation, the incredible things Jesus did, but yet they were. So what did they need to repent of? Their hardness of heart, their attitude toward, really I think their attitude toward God. They had an attitude toward God. God sins, it comes, literally comes himself essentially in the, in the form of Jesus Christ, and they still have a problem with everything he says and does. I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. It is. Uh, it, it truly is mind-boggling the the way that this this these scenes play out. And um, let's go to uh, Luke chapter thirteen now. And I, I, I'm, I'm finally done good to get everything put on screen for you. So if you're taking notes or whatever, of course you have your Bible. I appreciate that. That's fine. But in Luke chapter thirteen, this is another issue of repentance. This is another thing where Jesus is talking about repentance. And here he says there were, the Bible says that way anyway, there were present there, all right, let me, try, let me try that again. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Of the, or, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Accidents happen, and we talked about this morning. In this age, until the rapture of the church and get into the tribulation, there will not be a judgment like there was judgments in the Old Testament. 
that God is going to take somebody that's a, a ranked sinner and just you know and do whatever and judge them in some way on this side of, of judge on this side of really the great white throne as far as that goes. But you know there will be the, the judgments in Revelation where you have the bowls and the trumpets and all those things. That is those are judgments that are going to be poured out on the earth during the tribulation period. But in the current age, and I've said this morning, from the birth of Jesus until the rapture of the church, the idea that God is going to judge the way he judged Old Testament with the captivity, Babylonian and Persian captivity, with the flood, with, um, with other situations and things, Korah, whenever Korah rebelled against Moses, and the, I mean, the earth swallowed them up. That is the judgment of God. God said, Korah, done with you. And, you know, let's go ahead and you could bury you now and pull you down into the earth and you're dead and those with you. Uh, that's the judgment I'm talking about. And what I brought up this morning about, like, Hurricane Katrina. And whenever, whenever that the preacher on TV said that Hurricane Katrina is God's judgment on an evil city of New Orleans. If, if that's the case, then the, 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 the rainbow promise that God wouldn't flood the earth again. Is that, is that a loophole for that? I mean, I talked about it this morning, but, but folks, we've got to understand something today. God is not waiting to zap us, to flood us, to send something to destroy us. He is slow, he is slow to anger, rich in, in mercy and compassion. And if God, if God was going to have that kind of judgment today, like he had in the Old Testament, like we know he'll have during the tribulation, and, and ultimately the great white throne judgment, then how many, well... Yeah, I'll go ahead. I don't care. I know who. I know who's with me. And if somebody watching online that gets offended at me, please forgive me before I say it. Uh, you be, be ready for it. But if God was going to do that, Los Angeles would have been swallowed up in the earth by now. That earthquake that everybody thinks is going to happen is going to drop California in the ocean. It doesn't be gone. Um, Washington D.C. I'm sure by now, all liars have their place. Well, those are those liars would then be swallowed up like Cora and his bunch. Uh, New York City would probably be gone by now. Uh, you know, there'd be all kinds of all kinds of things, and there'd be hail mingled with fire falling down in cities and places, and there would be. I mean, if, if God was still, if God was going to do during this dispensation of grace, which was what we're living in, if He was going to judge that way, then it would be a common occurrence. But to take a natural disaster like a hurricane or tornadoes or even fire or some of this other, other kind of stuff that people, this COVID virus, that, that some of these preachers that, that think they know something want to get up and say this is God's judgment on whatever. The, you can't back that up with Scripture. He does not do that now. Did he do it in the Old Testament? Yes, he did. And there were all kinds of, I mean, the, the, the snakes. Again, I'm glad I live when I live. Because you've got snakes going around biting people. And the, the cure for that is to look at a bronze serpent. Why? Because there's the judgment and God gives the salvation. I love that and there's something powerful about that. But that was then, this is now. Today our salvation is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. I don't have to worry about something coming up, you know, the snakes coming up and bite me. Now there are snakes that could bite me and, uh, you know, what, that, you know, and I'll probably stay awake a little tonight because I said that. But, <laughs> but I'm still struggling about them horses I talked about this morning that's going to have snakehead tails. Uh, no, uh, the horses. You know, horses are nice, sweet, loving creatures for the most part, and they should not have snake tails. That's just and they can bite you and hurt you, and, and it's a bad, bad. That's a bad deal. Please, Lord, let the rapture. It let be the rapture, and then the snake head tail horses. I don't. I don't want to be here for any of that. I don't. I don't even want to see that. D sent me a deal. I, I should. I, I, I thought about it. I'd have a picture. D sent me a picture. And it is, a, it is a person, it's a bed, it's a bed spread that you can buy. It's one of these photo print things that you can get. And it looks like a bunch of boa constrictor snakes on that bed. I just, I'd have to sleep somewhere else. If that was in the house, I would sleep somewhere else. I don't even, I don't even like that. It's on my phone still. She, she texted me, and, and I, it's, I, I can't believe I hadn't deleted that thing. Because, it, you know, it's just like, just talking about it right now, I'm not kidding, goosebumps. I, I kid you not. I can't handle it. I still, out of the house, there is a snake skin that is long that I keep, I keep finding them occasionally behind the house. I've not found the snake, not seen the snake yet. One of these days, I'm going to reach in there and turn that water faucet on, or I'm going to be weeding out there by the air conditioner on the back side of the house back there is where, where I always find these things. I did find one up under the freezer in the garage. That was fun. <clears throat> that was a pleasant moment, and I'm pretty sure I prayed right there on the spot. But it's like, no, this is, no. But if God, if God was going to judge me, he'd use snakes. I think that would, because that would be the worst. That would be the thing. 
But there is the idea in the world today that God's just waiting to zap us. He's just waiting to get us. And what would that be? That would be the judgment. And he doesn't work that way under grace. He wants to give us time. He would that no one perish. And I don't mean to re re preach this morning's message, but that's it's just all, it all like I said, it's really kind of cool that this Sunday morning, tonight, and our Wednesday night, just all just are just so intermingled with each other and just like a it's like just really cool how this has all come together now. I mean it's just it's just the, the progression of where we are in it. And um, it's it's really kind of cool how, how it's all working together. So uh, the final answer that Jesus gives us is found in Luke chapter number 20. Um, sorry, I've got two things going here. I've got notes and I've got my presentation. Luke chapter 24. And of course, this is the uh, this is this is toward the end of his time where Luke records here that this had, thus he said to them, thus it is written, and thus is necessary for Christ to suffer and rise again the third day that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. So for three and a half years, Jesus has taught them, led them, guided them, get, given them the gospel that they are to carry into this world. He has shown them what it means. He has given them everything that they need to have and understand. And then he's told them, now here's the real point of this. The Lamb of God be slain for the sins of the world, essentially. So, repentance and remission of sin. And the remission of sin can only happen through Him and through His, through his shed blood. And that takes us into, that takes us into the, the understanding of the message of the gospel. So, um, you know, we're talking about a change of direction. Not just saying, I'm sorry, or I wish I hadn't done this, or even a mental attitude change. We're talking about a turning from a sinful, godless way of living into a place that is that we are not capable of by ourselves. Because left our own devices, we will find a way, and sometimes invent ways to sin. But I still come back and I think about this, and this isn't in my notes, it's just something that, that kind of popped in my head just now is when Jesus said that, that you, know, you have a home that, that the, the demons are cast out and, and the house is swept and put in order. And that demon goes out and he looks, he looks for a place and couldn't find any place and comes back and finds it empty. And he goes and gets, I think he said, seven more worse than himself. And the condition of the house is worse than it was at the first, right? What I think of in my mind with that is, is that human beings left their own devices, and you can see this, internet, movies, television, um, music, the church. If we're running the show, if we're calling the shots and doing things our way, other than, rather than God's way, we're going to corrupt it, we're going to stain it, we're going to make it something that it's never intended to be, and it will be tarnished at the very least, and it may well be completely unrecognizable if we let it. Jim Jones. All of us in here except maybe one is old enough to at least know that name. You've heard me say that name enough, Carter, that you probably uh, have heard me say it and know a little bit about it. Jim Jones was a man who preached the gospel just like I'm preaching to you right now. He talked about the power of God, the Word of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in his beginning. At the end, he thought, he, he claimed he was Messiah. And he led all those people to go down into the jungle and commit suicide and rather than change and actually realize that they were wrong. And it's, just, it's incredible. And you've got, I mean, you got the Hale Bob common people. You've got the Harold Camping folks who believe that, who did believe. I think, you know, he's dead now, I'm pretty sure. I think I heard that he died. Yes. But he said, you know, that Jesus is coming back October or whatever. May, no, the first time he said May something. And then after that rolled around, he said, well, my math was a little off. So it's going to be October. And then October rolled around, and like I told you too, Brother Garrison, our district superintendent, who used to be our assistant general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, who's who, um, who our, our good friend, he pastored the, the man who wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 88. It was a real book. People bought it. And, the, and he, <laughs> he was an Assemblies of God man that went to an Assemblies of God church, and this man wrote this book, Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. And it's like, dude, can you just read one verse of scripture that says that nobody knows the hour of the day? There's no secret code. There's nothing to decipher. There's nothing to figure out. What I'm told to do is wait. And while I'm waiting, I need to repent. And while I'm, while I'm living for Jesus, then I need to stay consistent, stay focused, and stay determined that I'm going to live for the Lord faithfully, consistently, the best I can. If I mess up, I repent. 
I don't say I'm sorry, I wish I hadn't done it, and go right back into the hog pen. I go ahead and I get out of the hog pen, clean myself up, and go and, and do something better, and hopefully find something else. But I can tell you again, as a pastor, what have I witnessed over the years? I witnessed somebody that would go from this, and they'd repent, get things straightened out, the next thing you know over here, here's something new, here's something new, here's something else new. You know, the, the, the couple I told you about that the young man ended up, and I ended up having to bury him, and, and he had gotten clean of, of meth and got himself straightened out and was getting his life back in order in just a series of events that, that wound up, he wound up getting shot, and the guy that shot him committed suicide. He tried to kill the, the, even the young lady, but, um, but you know, when, when he got into the meth so bad, and when he and the, the couple got into meth so bad, they have been coming to our church for a couple years. Two or three years. Good family. Good guys. Man, they was faithful to church and they had beautiful children. She had a couple of kids and they had a couple together. And um, or he had, anyway, they had several kids and it was just beautiful family, wonderful folks, great thing. And here this man is living for Jesus and all of a sudden they disappeared. And then I come to find out, yeah, they got in the meth and even got arrested, got in the mess. All, you know, everything, one thing leads to another. He comes back to church. And we talk, we work it out, and I, and I, I deal with him. I said, man, let's, let's, go, let's go a day. And I talk to the man every day about 3 o'clock in the afternoon for two solid weeks. Can you make it a day? Yes, I can make it a day. Well, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Let's pray. Let's do. And, I, and I, I counseled him through to the place where he was like, I got this. And I talked to him every couple of days. And then it was once a week. And it was every time, you know, in church. He would come to church, bring the kids and stuff. Really doing great. And then, like I said, the... His ex-wife in that, that circumstance, his ex-wife had met somebody in drug court that became her boyfriend. And then she told him, no, forget about it. I'm going back to my husband, getting my kids back. We're getting our life back. She got off the drugs. He, got, he was completely clean off the drugs by the grace and help of God. God delivered him, literally. And the next thing you know, I get the call. He's dead. She's injured. And the guy committed suicide. And I stood there in a... In a funeral chapel in Hope, Arkansas, and I, and I preached to his three little children, little girl that was less than two, how good her, how, how their daddy loved Jesus, and he did, and how he had gotten his life back, and I sat to stand there and look at those children. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I'm telling you, I'm, and I, I don't say that lightly, because we've been through a lot in our own personal lives, but as a pastor, no question, that was the hardest, hardest moment of ministry so far that I can think of. But we've seen some pretty, we, we've been through some pretty rough stuff, honestly. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's part it's part of what part of what you deal with. But I'm just telling you, you know, to to see that. And like I say, this is a guy who had things going well. He had a good job. He was doing great. She was doing good. The kids. I mean, just everything about it was wonderful. And they wind up in that mess and just completely destroy their whole family. And um, just a sad, sad, tragic situation that you just look at and wonder. You know, you sit. And I'll be. I, I was. I will say this for me. But you look at that and say, how? How do you get there? How do you go to that place? It is that, it is that thing. It's temptation. It is opportunity. And as I, you've heard me say this. There's always opportunity to sin. There's always opportunity before you to do anything. And all kinds of stuff are available to us. We live in a world today where there is almost nothing that if you want it, you can't get your hand on it. Um, I don't care who you are or what you are. You understand and realize that there have been Wall Street tycoons, there have been CEOs of companies that have got into drugs or alcohol or some other illicit thing that their whole life has been completely blown up by that stuff. And all that is just opportunity. It was a situation. It was a circumstance. We were watching a show the other night that was talking about um, talking about some of these, these kids that were child actors and talking about you know the, the, the mess that they got themselves into. And uh, Robin Williams is one of them. Robin Williams is a sad, sad story in his, in his story. But the night that Jim Belushi died, Robin Williams had been with him. They had been hanging out and doing drugs together. And Jim Belushi, or John Belushi, excuse me, John Belushi did too much. And he, over, he overdosed. And Robin Williams comes into the set of, I don't know whether they were working on a movie or a TV show, I think. They thought Mork and Mindy, that's right. When they were making Mork and Mindy, John Belushi comes in and Pam Dauber looks at him and says, John's dead. And he's like, dude, I was there. I was with him. I was with him last night. And when I left, he was fine. Well, he didn't end up fine. 33 years old. Funny, one of the funniest people. Just be honest about it. I don't know if you ever watched Saturday Night Live. You may have been more sanctified than I was. Uh, but honest to goodness, back when Saturday Night Live was still funny, uh, now it's just garbage. I, I, don't, I don't know why anybody watches that mess now. But 
uh, in, all, in all truthfulness, but but back, you know, land shark, just dumb stuff, and you know, samurai, samurai something or other, he's always samurai something, uh, and John Bush, funny, funny guy, hilarious, and yet he couldn't handle the fame, couldn't handle the popularity. Opportunity was right there, and he, he killed, he literally killed himself with it. There's lots of famous people that have done that. Elvis Presley, Elvis Presley, one of the, one of the people, most popular singers for not everybody, he's not everybody's cup of tea, but, but when I was a kid, I loved Elvis. I thought he was the best. And the, the day he died, I was eight years old. I, I cried like a baby, um, you know, and, and it was such a sad, awful thing that should have never happened. The man sang gospel music. The man was, was gifted and talented and very charismatic and very just, I mean, just some, somebody that, that could do anything he set his mind to do, he could do it. But yet he died in his bathroom of a drug overdose in a shameful, awful, terrible way. That's what sin, that's what sin does. And that's, that's how sin gets us pulled in. And it is one thing leads to another. And those things happen. Uh, and, and it's sad, but that's the reality of it. So um, working here toward getting concluded on this thing, I've got I've to sort through what I've got here. Okay, so um, okay, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm sorting out, I'm sorting out my stuff. Like I've got too many things going on here, honestly. But in um, Acts chapter 5, let's go to Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Acts chapter 5, and verse 31. Um, where it says, Him God has exalted at the right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit who God has given to those who obey him. So the obedience, the faithfulness, the, the, the giving of, of, of repentance, it says, um, again, I'll go back again. I want to, I want to kind of focus in on that. That God has exalted him to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. This is an open invitation. That God says, here it is. This is yours. This is, this is what I have for you. Is that sin is no longer a problem for you. Sin is no longer an issue for you. Because I have given you a way out. I have given you an escape hatch. And provided everything that you need in order to be victorious over sin, and yet, and yet so much of the world uh, of, of then and now are caught up in this and caught up in the mess that just isn't what God had intended for anybody. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about, as we mentioned, talked about Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger, um, and there's, there's others and lots of others that you look at over, over modern history and you think, how, why? You have got, you know, how did you have time for that? I can say for me, I mean, these guys are making television programs or doing all the stuff they're doing. And I'll tell you, over the last couple of months, and just doing what I do, it's like, I don't have, I ain't had time for nothing. I can assure you, somebody, somebody said, what have you been up to? I said, well, they ain't been trouble. I ain't had no time for it. I, I'm, just, I'm just busy. And, and as soon as I get one thing done and something else, in the midst of this, we did the go, you know, we did some work on the, the fashion for the gutters and, and other odds and ends of stuff that we've done and, and besides just making you know videos and doing all the stuff we've been doing over the course of all this but it's um, you know i'm glad i'm glad i have found for me and this is just confession good so i have found for me the busier i stay the better off i am because i don't spend off into with something else or messing with something else if i you know i'm hands of the devil's workshop that's a fact and that, that applies to the world that applies to all of us and uh, I can tell you the times that I've made it a point to stay busy and keep focused on something and be doing something. And, and for here lately, it's been go from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing. And something else needs to be done here at the house or studying, working, getting stuff ready for this and that and something else. And all this stuff, it's like, I, I don't, I'm, only, I'm, in, I'm in a good place right now because uh, I'm, there's nothing that I have time. I don't have time for anything else. And uh, that's, that's a good thing. So... In Luke, excuse me, in Acts chapter 18, Luke's other gospel, in Acts chapter 18, the Bible gives us the story here of, of um, Peter's, not Peter, excuse me, of Paul. No, this is Peter. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. This is the story where Peter is um, told to rise, kill, and eat. Okay, I'm not going to read all of the detail. I'm going to look at one verse toward the end. But... Peter had, Peter had had this experience where there was a sheet let down from heaven and the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He said, nope, I'm not anything unclean. 
and I'm not, you know, that's just not, that's not what I'm willing to do here. And, and this is, this is good news for you and I, this is a blessing for us because pork chops are now on the menu because of this and bacon and, um, bacon and bacon. Um, you know, I like to have a bacon, bacon sandwich, you know, throw some lettuce and tomato on it if you want to, I suppose, but, but, uh, and new exciting ways to, to work bacon into your diet. That's, that's what we, that's, that's, you know, the bacon cookbook. Somebody, I'm sure has made one. I'm going to see if I can find it. And then, Next Sunday's fellowship, maybe we can do something with bacon. But, but in, in, in all seriousness, you know, I, I, I'm sorry I spin off on stuff sometimes. But this is this is where he sees that happen, and then he's called to Cornelius's house, and he gets to Cornelius's house, and he preaches the gospel, and then he comes back, and this is where he comes back to to the council, basically he comes back to the other disciples that have yet to understand that the Gentiles are now welcome in. The kingdom, essentially. I mean, I'm trying to think of the way to word that, but up to this point, the mindset was this is about the Jews. And even to this point, it's just for the Jews. And I guess if you want to become a believer in Jesus Christ, you become a Jew, and then you can become, you know, then you can go on and, and be a part of the, the kingdom of God. And that was the mindset up to this point. And so John here, or excuse me, I'm looking at John, I'm looking at something that says John here, and then and get to the, the point I'm trying to get to here that I'm going to read, uh, verse number 18, that, that the understanding here is, is that whenever these people accept Jesus and they come to that place of repentance and they come to that place where the fruit and the evidence of that is the Holy Spirit fell on them. You find that actually back in verse number 15. Says, so he began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as it was at the beginning. And just like John the Baptist said, indeed, uh, John baptized the water, but you should be baptized the Holy Spirit. So, he says in verse 17, if therefore God gave them the same gift he gave us, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, so who was I to withstand God? And then that takes me to uh, verse 18 that I do have in my notes here and have on the screen. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted the Gentiles repentance to life. So at this moment, in Acts chapter 11, it now is, for God so loved the world, comes to complete fruition. It's just to put it in a manner, in a way of speaking here. And the, uh, the result of this, the importance of this for you and I is, is that we don't have to become Jews, that all we have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. And when we have that heart, that attitude, that mindset, that brings us to the place of of a, a full life and that, that abundant life in Jesus Christ. In, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I got a lot of scripture and I'm getting, I, I tell you, you may have noticed this lately, um, I'm getting where I use an awful lot of scripture, or not awful, that's not the right word for it, but a lot of scripture because nothing, nothing backs up scripture better than scripture. My opinions, my thoughts, whatever, that's all well and fine, and I have those, but, but bringing it home with, with the verses that, that really speak to this, and I really feel like that's something that God has really spoken to my heart, and I'm using a lot of scripture Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night for the most part. So, um, so here in um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, start verse 34, uh, a servant, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over all who call upon him. For whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, I just jumped scriptures there. Hold on. I skipped. I'm, my bad. All right, let me come back. All right, they, all right let's, let's just start that back over. 2 Timothy chapter 2. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance that they may know the truth. Then it should have said, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive to him, by him to do his will. So right there, I'm going to stay right there just for a second. This snare of the devil, what are we talking about? Temptation. So that temptation shows up, and we've already we've already had that opportunity to repent, and that he used in the, the middle verse there, that God will grant them repentance, and he has granted us repentance, he's given us that opportunity, and he gives us the privilege to have that, uh, you know, have that out, have that, that escape hatch, if you will, to get out of the mess and stay out of the mess, and even if we get in the mess, 
we still have the ability through grace to get out of the mess once again. And, you know, however many times we keep going back to the hawk trough, he's going to still forgive us and love us. And uh, that's, that's pretty good news for, for a lot of people, I can tell you. And I really believe that that is uh, a key aspect of the gospel when it comes down to it. And in closing tonight, we are going to look at, at Romans chapter number 10, and this is the, the old Roman road. And Paul writes to him and says, But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess the Lord with your mouth, uh, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a little deja vu there for you. Um, but it, uh, but you know, we know that, we understand that, we think about that. But you know, there's there has got to be a point in time in every person's life that hears the gospel where they say, now what do I do? How do I go from here? And this, this is what Acts chapter 2, 38 to 39 gives us. And we know as we go back a little bit and, uh, and conclude tonight's part, and I may, bring, I may kind of go from there, from this uh, launching point here uh, next week as we go and look at the, the end of the chapter and start into chapter number 3, that verse 29, or 39, excuse me, for the promises to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. What what you have here, now remember, um, you're, you're preaching, this is preaching minister to Jews. All these people are Jewish. They've all come to Jerusalem from all over the place. Remember we got the Phoenicians and the, or the, the, um, the Medes and the, all, the, all the people that, that were listed there, those that heard the wonderful works of God from early in the chapter and that we talk about, we know that well. But these are Jewish people. These are all Jews, and there is there is no exception to this at this point because we've not got to chapter eleven yet. We're still there, and when you hear when you as a Jew, and I think we can get this as, as much today as they would have been, as a Jew, when you hear that phrase, the promise, those two words together, what are they hearing? The promise of the Messiah, the promise that God promised that in Abraham all the world, all the nations are be, of the world will be blessed. That you know, Messiah is coming. That David was promised that that one of his descendants would be on the throne forever, and you know those promises. So to a Jew, when they hear that phrase, the promise is to your, your you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. This is this is a point in time where these people understand. Okay, I'm repenting and I'm accepting Messiah. I'm accepting Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, as Messiah, as the Anointed One, as the Christ. On and on you can go with all the, the references to Jesus. And that promise that they, that, they are, that they are accepting, the fulfillment of the promise through Jesus Christ, and in that moment, that is a powerful moment when Peter says that to them because what they're all, what they've all recognized and realized here in this moment is, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what we've heard our whole entire lives around the campfire, around the table, around whatever. Messiah's coming. Messiah's coming. He's coming. And you know, we're going to hear when John started preaching and teaching. They were kind of excited. Some thought John might be the Messiah. John the Baptist might be Messiah. And you know, and then of course, then he comes up and says, you know, I'm, I'm not the one. I'm not worthy of to untie his shoes. And you know, we go from there, and we know the story. But, but as we uh, as we conclude our time tonight, and you think about how the day of Pentecost wraps up here at this at this particular moment, and you and we we see the key of the point here, and I focused on the, the repentance aspect and everything from what John the Baptist had to say, all the way through even even beyond that into the epistles. The the key and the key and everything that this has to do with is that it's repentance. And that repentance has to be a change, has to be a departure from what we have been, what we have become, what we are, and to what we're trying to get to. And I love the map illustration. I love that journey idea that I've talked about over recent weeks, and that has become pretty much the pattern of what it is that I share when I talk about repentance and talk about those things, because what it boils down to is, is that we are on the journey. We have the destination, but... How do we get there? That's what we don't know. 
Those are questions. There are questions we have about how we get from here to our mansion in glory. Just, just, to, just to really broad cap there, I realize that. But how do we get from right here, right now, on July the 19th of 2020 at 7.06 p.m., how do we get from here to the mansion Jesus has prepared for us? That's the journey. And sometimes on those journeys, there are, there are um, detours, there are distractions, there are holdups, there's traffic jams, there's all kinds of issues that we're going to run into. And what we have to decide is, is that we're going to stay on the journey, stay on the path. And while we may not know, and this, this gets into faith, you know, how many times has there, has there been in your life? I know I can say that some in mine, I can tell stories, and I'm going to do it tonight. But where I really, I'm ready to take that next step, and I don't know where my foot's coming down. I can take you back six and a half, almost six and a half years ago, six years and a few months. Sitting in Rosebud, Arkansas, I was walking around the sanctuary of Rosebud, Arkansas in, in about February of 2014, and I knew that God was speaking to my heart that it's time to it's time to transition, it's time to go somewhere else. Your work here that I, I brought you here to do is done, and there's some other place for you. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and as sure as I'm standing here right now, it was everything but giving me the phone number that I needed for Terry Yancey to call him and say. You know, you told me in 2001 that if I was ever looking to come to Kansas to call you, here I am. And the rest is history, as they say. And I can assure you, through that whole process and even driving up here and, you know, coming, making the journey up here that, that first weekend that we met each other and then everything that, everything that transpired that weekend, you know, every, there, there's so many things about that I can tell you that I, I won't take the time tonight. It's, it's time to head home. But, but you know, that next step, I'll be honest, I wasn't sure. I wasn't positive. But now when you folks come in and said, you know, unanimous vote, and and then we're eating lunch over here and, and uh, with uh, Kay and Claude and Dan and Pam and and uh, uh, Roy and Mary, and I said, well, what's the term? How, how, long, how long do I get voted in for? Well, indefinite. What? They don't do that in Arkansas. <laughs> Nobody does. I couldn't tell you. I can assure you, I don't know a pastor. I, I don't know of another pastor that on his initial vote at the church, first time ever, that they just say, you're here for life if you want to be. As long as God wants you to be here, you're welcome. You know, we want you to be here. And I'm just, because I think Kay's my ass had, and Kay said, well, it's indefinite. I'm like, sorry, what? <laughs> that, don't, you know, that didn't compute. I, I had no idea. I wasn't, I wasn't concerned about it. And, you know, like I say, the Lord says it's time to go. We're going to go. And I'm not looking for that anytime soon. Of course, I wasn't expecting that in the time we have moved either. But, and got, you know, kind of got a little little blowback on that from uh, from uh, from one person when we left the one church. They they called me and said, I thought you want to be here forever. I thought you want to retire here. And I do. I did. I want to retire in Hiawatha. That's fine with me. But if the Lord says go, we're going to go. Just like when God said come, we came. And, and you know, y'all y'all uh, y'all helped us make that decision by by the by the vote and the way things went, it was answered prayer, and uh, thank God for it. But I can assure you that as we're, you know, thinking and praying, as we talked to y'all on the phone, little phone interview and all that kind of stuff, it's like, okay. And then what? I don't know if I've ever told you. I'll go ahead and tell you now. Um, that afternoon, after I had talked to you, I talked to a church in Oklahoma, and I, you knew about the church in Oklahoma, I think. But I talked to a church in Oklahoma, and they had scheduled us and said. Well, if things don't work out in Kansas, come see us the next weekend. I said, well, pencil us in. That'd be Easter Sunday. I don't know about, about trying out on Easter Sunday. Of course, Easter Sunday, that's kind of Super Bowl Sunday for a preacher. So, you know, they've got, they've got some of the best stuff. And I think some of the best stuff I preach comes in on Easter but, but uh, that God's ever given me. But, you know, and that afternoon after we had lunch, we went down here to the, to the, uh, the hotel, and I got on the phone, and I called, and I said, well, I said, you better find somebody else for Easter Sunday. I said, we're, we're going to load up a truck. We're coming back to Kansas by the middle of this week. And, uh, and one guy, he was very nice about it. He said, he said I told y'all. And I told y'all we just got to them too late. And, uh, and I told him, I said, listen, I said, I think it's God's will. I said, God's got somebody for you. I know he does. And, but it was just, you know, and just so much that, that went into that whole situation. But like I say, it was, it was that step of faith. It was stepping where I wasn't seeing. And sometimes we have to do that. And uh, 
I'm glad. I, I don't regret it for one second. I thank God for what he's done for us and how he's blessed us. And um, I know, I know as we trust him, I know as we look to him, he's going to guide us and help us. And he has granted us so much. And it all starts with repentance. It all starts with a decision. What must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized. And uh, we may talk a little bit, about, a little bit about, about baptism next Sunday night, but I think we all understand that. We all have been sitting here, so uh, that's not a, a, a big deal for us to, to study in, in depth on. But uh, we can talk about the, the whys and the what fors, and I think that might, might be a good, a good subject we'll get for a little while next week. So thoughts or questions before we dismiss? All right. Father, I love you. I thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. And ask you, Lord God, to speak blessings.